Well, hi there. If you're new to our channel, you should probably know that snakes are lizards, that birds are dinosaurs and therefore reptiles, and that you are basically the hagfish of reptiles. And if you're still here after hearing all of that, well, you're in the right place. Because it turns out that butterflies are crustaceans, which, as far as I'm concerned, is just wonderful. Because for much of my life, crustacea has been a garbage bin of arthropods. But it seems that today, thanks in no small part to the addition of butterflies to the clade, that the crustacea finally represents a monophyletic group, a common ancestor and all of its descendants. And when it comes to phylogenetic classification, which is by far the most useful and predictive form of organismal classification ever invented by humans, monophyletic groups are by far the best. All other groups are just garbage bins we haven't managed to sort out. So next time you see a butterfly, be sure to tell it thank you. Crustaceans, like all arthropods, are bilaterally symmetrical animals with exoskeletons that grow through ecdysis and have jointed appendages. This means that they have left-right symmetry, but no other forms of symmetry like what you would see in animals like jellyfish, for example. They keep their skeletons on the outside of their body. They grow by molting their cuticle, popping out of their existing exoskeleton, inflating a larger exoskeleton that they grew inside of the smaller one, hardening up and then walking, flying, or swimming away. And their hard appendages have joints, like a suit of armor, so they can move. Arthropods are the most successful group of animals on the planet, and now that butterflies and their hexapod buddies are part of the party, crustaceans are the most successful group of arthropods. The clade that includes all of the crustaceans, including the butterflies, is called the pancrustacea. And the pancrustacea includes the most recent common ancestor of branchiopods, like triops, and ostracods, which look like little clams until their little shrimp legs come poking out and they swim away. As well as everything else that comes from those ancestors, including butterflies. There are, within the pancrustacea, Two big clades, the Oligostraca and the Altocrustacea. The Oligostraca includes the ostracods that we mentioned earlier, as well as a bunch of other creatures from your nightmares. But let's start with the ostracods and, and we'll work our way up to the tongue worms. You just don't start a polite conversation about arthropods with a deep dive into parasites that look like disembodied tongues. It's bad form. Maybe not worse than starting out with parasites that sever the blood supply to the tongue, causing it to wither and die before falling off, only to be replaced by the twisted isopod that killed it. You know, so you have an isopod for a tongue. We'll get to those also, but it's still bad form to start with tongue worms. So, ostracods. I said that they look like little clams. Well, they do, and they're pretty small. The largest species on Earth today is just one inch, 30 millimeters across. Most are around one millimeter, so one thirtieth of an inch, diminutive. They are, by far, the most well-represented arthropods in the fossil record, which is saying a lot. And that is in no small part thanks to their shell, which looks like the two-part shell of a bivalve mollusk, but is made of chitin because, well, this is an arthropod. Shells tend to fossilize well, and it's okay to love these little guys. I get pretty excited whenever I find one, but it is okay because of all the members of the Oligostraca, the ostracods are the most distantly related to, to the tongue worms. The next most distantly related members of the Oligostraca to the tongue worms are the members of the order Mystacocaridida. I'd wager that you've been around these guys before and never knew. They live between grains of sand on the beach and are less than one one thousandth of a meter long. They look a little like tiny mosquito larvae with long antennae and larger appendages on their heads than on their thoraxes. And a single eye. You've probably never seen one, but if you're ever examining intertidal beach sand samples under a microscope and you see something that fits that description, you'll know what you have. And thus ends our polite conversation about crustaceans, because the two remaining members of this clade are either parasitic nightmares whose closest relatives are tongue worms, or they are actually tongue worms. Which one do you want first? 
Let's just go straight to the tongue worms and then find out if their closest relatives are any less horrifying. Pentastomidia, also called tongue worms, look, apparently, like disembodied tongues. Though if your tongue looks like that, uh, you should probably talk to a doctor about it. I'd say they look more like leeches. And while they are parasites like leeches, you're unlikely to confuse the two unless you accidentally inhaled a leech, which is a terrible proposition indeed. Because tongue worms live in the respiratory tracts of vertebrates like you. And I wish that I could tell you that they're small enough to live undetected between grains of sand like their cousins, but it turns out that they can be as large as about 14 centimeters, over five and a half inches. That is over an inch and a half longer than the longest human tongue on record, but with five hook-like appendages on its face. Like their annelid doppelgangers, tongue worms feed on blood, except for one species that feeds primarily on mucus. But again, they live in the upper respiratory tracts of carnivorous terrestrial vertebrates. Like you. And how did they get there? I was hoping you'd ask. Unlike leeches, tongue worms are dioecious, meaning that they have separate males and females. So apparently, if you have tongue worms inhabiting your upper respiratory tract, drinking your blood and eating your boogers, you are likely to have, well, more than one. And if you have more than one and they are breeding in your respiratory tract, the eggs make their way out, either by being coughed or sneezed or by making their way through your digestive tract and out the way things generally make their way out from there. And then they are often eaten by a fish because all drains lead to the ocean or some herbivorous animal eats them. Once they hatch, the cute little baby tongue worms make their way through the intestinal wall of these creatures and insist themselves in the animal's tissue until some unfortunate carnivore eats their host. Once that happens, they crawl up your esophagus and into your upper respiratory system, hook in and start drinking. You see, uh, this is why we didn't start with the tongue worms. It's hard to imagine that their closest relatives could be any more horrifying, but let's give them a chance anyway. Brachiura, also known as uh, fish lice, so we're off to a decent start. They also eat blood and mucus, but at least they have the decency to do so from the outside of the body. And they don't look like tongues or, or leeches. They look like what you would think that a fish louse would look like, at least if aquatic lice are like an inch long. They have a flat oval shaped body, four pairs of swimming legs, and two suction cups or hooks at the front, as well as a spearing blood sucking proboscis, and a pair of compound eyes. They honestly look like tailless fairy shrimp that suck the blood out of aquatic animals for fun. Except uh, being obligate parasites, they really don't have a say in the matter. Look, it's the thing of nightmares, but honestly compared to the tongue worms, they seem darn right cuddly. And that brings us to the Alto Crustacea and our discussion of butterflies as crustaceans, because uh, they totally are. Everything in this group is more closely related to butterflies than it is to any of the Oligostraca. But that doesn't mean that we could just stop considering Oligostraca to be part of the crustaceans and then we would be fine just kicking out the butterflies. Let me give you a list of the other crustaceans that would also need to go. Because the Alto Crustacea is divided into two major clades, the Multicrustacea and the Allotrio Corida. And it turns out that everything in the Allotrio Corida is more closely related to butterflies than it is to the Multicrustacea. Meaning that in addition to removing the Oligostraca, we would need to remove the Allotrio Corida. Of the members of the Allotrio Corida, the most distantly related to the butterflies would be the Cephalo Corida, otherwise known as horseshoe shrimp. Not to be confused with horseshoe crabs, which are not crustaceans at all. They're chelicerates, similar to the arachnids that we covered in uh, this video. You would never confuse the two because they look nothing alike. The only thing which you would confuse with a horseshoe shrimp would be the members of the Mystaco Corridida. Horseshoe shrimp are also intertidal sand residents that feed on detritus. But they're comparatively huge, sometimes reaching four thousandths of a meter in length. Massive. They also lack the large head appendages and the eye. They don't even get one eye. So it probably wouldn't break your heart to kick them out of the crustaceans. But what about this? That's right, triops. They'd have to go. And not just them, but also the brine shrimp, the ostracod-like 
clam shrimp, water fleas, and all of the rest of the brachiopoda. Because it turns out that the brachiopods are even more closely related to butterflies than they are to horseshoe shrimp or anything else we've discussed so far. They're also more closely related to butterflies than are things like isopods and myriapods, such as millipedes, and their toxicognath-wielding cousins, the centipedes. Did we just bring them up to discuss toxicognaths? Would I, would I really do that? Anyway, the brachiopods are more closely related to butterflies than are any of these things. This group is unified by the gills on their appendages. That's actually what brachiopoda means. And the clam shrimp can be distinguished from the ostracods by the fact that their limbs cannot exit the bivalve carapace. So they swim with their antenna instead, which is stinking rad. But if the butterflies aren't crustaceans, then neither are they. Nor these, the Remipedia, which look like small, pigmentless, eyeless, back-swimming marine centipedes with biramus, meaning two-branched swimming limbs, going all the way down their bodies. Now, these aren't centipedes. They're not even myriapods. I'll let you decide if they should be considered crustaceans. But I think the question on all of our minds is, do they have toxicognaths? And the answer is, uh, no, but also sort of. They do have fangs, uh, but to my knowledge, they are not modified legs. And uh, they definitely would not be homologous with the toxicognaths. So. But that brings us to the last group within the Allotrio Corrida, the Hexapoda. Hexapods are six-legged little arthropods with a single pair of antennae, three main body regions, and no biramus appendages. This includes animals like springtails, but also the insects, such as butterflies. And I think this group deserves its own video, as it is the most speciose group of animals on the entire planet. So let me know if you'd like for me to make that soon. You know, if, if you're into that kind of thing. And if you would like to see us make phylogeny videos more often, perhaps for a phylogeny February next year or something like that, then I'm gonna need more time and we're gonna need more editors. So please consider supporting us on Patreon so that we can make this a possibility. But let's get back to butterflies. Are butterflies crustaceans? If they're not, then everything we have discussed so far will have to be excluded as well. And if that's the direction that you would like to go, then let me present to you everything that would be left. Assuming, of course, that crabs and lobsters are crustaceans. As well as those malicious tongue impersonators that we discussed earlier. The multi-crustacea. And this is the most speciose group of crustaceans other than the hexapoda. So you would still have quite a bit, even if this is everything. And as we are essentially restarting our discussion of crustaceans, so, so we would have a crustacea without tongue worms in it, we will start with something polite and work our way to horrifying. Good ball, bravo! Copepoda. The multi-crustacea is divided into two major clades, one with tongue-starving oral hitchhikers and the other with copepods. So let's talk about the copepod lineage first. The copepods are actually the most distantly related members of this lineage. Copepods are basically everywhere there is water on Earth. They are very diverse, but they are generally tiny, transparent, with a single red compound eye and giant antennae. Like I said, they are in the water basically everywhere. The ocean? Yes. Lakes? For sure. Puddle? Probably. Down in a bromeliad? Most likely. Under Antarctic ice? For sure. Under a wet leaf? Often. In ephemeral pools in the desert? You betcha. In an underground cave? What did I say? They're everywhere. If you're a copepod, the world is your oyster. And in a world full of copepods, it's, uh, it's nice to be a parasite of copepods. Like one of their two closest relatives, the Tantulocorida. These guys are ectoparasites of copepods, as well as many of the Malacostracans that we're going to discuss here in a moment. Also ostracods. One difference between parasites and predators is that parasites are generally not larger than their hosts. And thank goodness for that. I don't need to live in a world with car-sized leeches and 700-pound tongue worms popping out of your nose. But when you are a parasite of copepods, you really need to be small. And they are. These guys are about three ten thousandths of a meter long. That's shorter than an ostracod sperm cell. Of course, uh, 
So are ostracods. And this is a parasite of ostracods. But they're tiny. One species is the smallest of all arthropods. Their closest relatives are the barnacles and other members of the Thicostraca. These guys have mobile larvae, but settle down into sessile adults. Like copepods, larval Thicostracans are part of the zooplankton. Whales that feed on zooplankton therefore often become the mobile platform on which otherwise sessile barnacles reside. Given that there is no apparent harm to the whale, but the barnacles benefit, this is what nerds like me call a commensalism. And that brings us to the last group of crustaceans. Probably the most recognizable group of all. And the one with the buccal buccaneer in it. The Malacostraca. By the way, this video has so many disturbing descriptions of horrifying parasites that Leisha thinks that we should put a warning on it. So um, here's your warning. Better late than never, says I. Malacostraca! We really should make a whole video just about the Malacostraca. You know, you know, if you're into that kind of thing. But generally, this group includes animals like lobsters, crayfish, crabs, isopods, shrimp, krill, mantis, shrimp, and amphipods, among others. Malacostracans have three main body regions composed of 20 body segments. Five for the head, eight in the thorax, and six in the abdomen, capped off with a telson. One group has a seventh abdominal segment, giving them one more overall. They also have abdominal appendages, unlike all of the other crustaceans except for the Remipidia, which, once again, don't have toxicognaths. But almost. Just not technically. Like I said, this group will probably get its own video. Sooner than later, if we have enough support on Patreon. But for today, let's just finish up with a discussion about isopods that eat tongues, and then replace the tongues with isopods. Okay, let's start with the obvious. You're a crustacean. You have tongue in your name. What do you eat? Blood and mucus, obviously. Now, you could hang on the outside like a common fish louse, but that's not becoming of a crustacean with tongue in its name. That said, non-tetrapod fish do not have large nasal cavities. Their respiratory systems are pretty much all in the mouth, but that mouth is full of a tongue. And you need to leave some space for food to get by. Killing your host is not a great move for a parasite in most cases. If only that tongue wasn't in there. Problem solved. Using your front claws, you just severed the blood supply to that tongue. Then you contemplate the great questions of the universe while you wait for that tongue to necrose away and fall off. But wait, uh, don't fish need a tongue? Yeah, I, I guess I suppose they do. Well. You just hang on to the remaining tongue stump, sucking blood, needing mucus, mating with the male behind you in the fish's gills, and acting like a tongue for the rest of the fish's life. This is the only known parasite that destroys part of the body and then fills in for whatever it destroys. How thoughtful. I mean, I hate vandalism, but if you slash the tires of my car, but then wrap yourself around the wheel and act like a tire from that point on, can I really complain? It doesn't seem to harm the fish all that much either, though if you do get more than one tongue replacement, that can inhibit feeding. And on that happy note, what group should we cover next? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. That was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping more about crabs. Uh, yeah. And less about things that That's I'm one thing you don't need. about at night. Yeah. <laughs> If your tongue's gonna fall off, would you rather have a tongue replacement in the form of an isopod or just be tongueless? I might want to be tongueless. That sounds pretty horrible. <laughs> <laughs> what if you could still talk? Swallow normally. I don't care. <laughs> okay. It's gross. Hold on, I gotta wait for an ad. These YouTubers, they're the worst.